Hi, welcome to Introduction to Cultural Anthropology. I'm Savannah Sherman. I'll be the instructor for our course, and I am a cultural anthropologist. I love teaching this class, and so I'm really looking forward to the next several weeks with all of you. Today should be a pretty light lecture, although important. I'll give you a brief overview of what the course is about, some of the topics we'll be discussing, introduce myself a bit more, my research background and interests. We'll talk a little bit about how the course is going to go, how you're going to earn your grade, do well, and wrap up with a real brief introduction into what, what cultural anthropology is all about. So what is this class about? Let's start with the course description. Introductory Cultural Anthropology is a course where you will learn about exotic peoples living around the world and about your own cultural assumptions. From hallucinogen snuffing South American Indians to Melanesian fisher people to impoverished Bangladeshi peasants to suburban San Diegans, this class will introduce you to different ways of life. It will familiarize you with other societies while also making aspects of our own society seem strange. From this course, you'll be able to more fully understand and explain differences in the way that various groups of people organize and give meaning to their experience of a common world. To understand human diversity, we will go deeper and further than the superficial National Geographic specials we see on TV by thoroughly comparing our own lives with others of the past and present. In the process, you'll come to see that the lives, our lives, and the epoch in which we live may be just as strange and exotic as the lives of people inhabiting the bonga bonga lands of Africa, Asia, or the Pacific. Our way of life is just one among innumerable ways human beings have created a life world. In fact, we, along with face painted inhabitants from faraway places, are living in an immense so social experiment, which we call the modern or postmodern world. Unfortunately, one defining characteristic of our current epoch is unprecedented cultural and ecological destruction. As more and more forests are destroyed, livelihoods undermined and languages lost. The result being that the central interest of cultural anthropology, cultural diversity is vanishing before our eyes. What, if anything at all, should be done about cultural loss is one of anthropology's most intriguing and challenging puzzles. During our path of discovery in this course, you will gain an understanding of the issues addressed and methods employed by cultural anthropologists to comprehend human diversity. And in doing so, it will encourage you to accept, embrace, and defend a culturally rich and diverse world. So anthropology in general is the study of humans in all aspects, be it social or biological, both past and present. Cultural anthropology is a subfield of anthropology that focus, focuses specifically on the social and cultural systems of contemporary living people. And we're interested in all aspects of a people's culture, um, politics, religion, witchcraft, magic. Uh, how do they resolve conflicts? How do they decide who to get married? How do they know who's in their family? How do they make a, a living? What's their livelihood? Are they fishers? Are they farmers? Are they hunter gatherers? Do they work for wages in a capitalist economy like many of us do? How do they sort of make a living? And the goal is to sort of gain a comprehensive understanding of what's going on in different societies. In studying this variation, this diversity throughout space and time, we'll come to uncover a lot of differences between different groups, but also a lot of similarities, right? We all have to meet our needs in our environment to survive, but we all have very different ways of doing this, of getting married, of forming families, um, organizing ourselves politically. We all do these things, but often in different ways. And so one of the key themes running through this course is gonna be making the familiar, our own culture, seem a little bit more strange, a little more exotic, while making the other cultures around the world a little more familiar, a little less exotic. Um, what seems strange to you is perfectly normal to someone from another culture. And likewise, what seems very normal to you or just the way that you do things is absolutely bizarre to people from other cultures. A lot of this is because 
what we see as sort of normal or strange is shaped by our culture. And our culture, our life way is just one among countless ways of organizing a society. Uh, so some of the topics we'll be digging into, um, what is the role of religion or from an anthropological perspective, beliefs and practices in the supernatural. This includes witchcraft, magic, and religion. Why do people practice and believe in these things? What does it do for them? Some of you might be surprised to find out you actually practice magic too. Um, I promise I'm not crazy, hang in there. You just don't call it magic. You don't perceive it in that exotified way. <clears throat> Why do some people around the world have really large families with six to 10 children? while other places, namely developed countries, have small families, maybe one to two kids, um, if any at all. Why in some places do people share freely with each other while in other places um, will avoid eye contact with someone rather than being asked for spare change? Um, wh what are the reasons why societies practice monogamy or polygamy? Um, monogamy actually, from the perspective of anthropology, is not the predominant form of marriage around the world, at least um, not until recently. <clears throat> and there's reasons that underlie why people do things differently. What about progress, so-called cultural progress? What is that? <clears throat> Running water is nice. Uh, maybe that's progress. Electricity, maybe. But what about environmental destruction and social injustice and the fact that a billion people around the world are living in desolate poverty, starving, malnourished, while another billion are overconsuming, are overnourished? Is that, is that progress? Um, what about inequality and poverty? Are these inevitable? And I'll just say right now, no, they're not. They're related and they're created. <clears throat> What about wealth? What is wealth anyways? Is it money? Maybe for many of us here in the US, what about non-material wealth and well-being? Um, a lot of evidence, the data shows that money doesn't in fact actually make us all that happy. It matters, you have to be above the breadline, you have to be able to meet your needs. Um, and if you're super rich, tends to be a bit higher correlation of happiness levels. But for all the rest of us, there's no real correlation because there's so many other things that go into well-being and happiness. So these are some of the questions and topics we'll be digging into and hopefully um, answering a bit as we move throughout the course. Uh, introductions, a little bit more about myself. <clears throat> Again, I'm Savannah Sherman, the instructor for the course. Um, there's several different ways for you to interact with me or contact me. One, we'll be holding live class sessions on Tuesdays from 11 to 1230. I encourage you to come. You should all, if you are able, come to the first one tomorrow. Um, if you're not able to come, no problem. It won't count against you. They're not absolutely required. I just encourage you to come. Um, Office hours as well, I'll be holding those. Out. I'm also available by appointment. So if you have scheduling conflicts or you have reasons you prefer to watch the recordings of our live sessions rather than attend, no problem, contact me, reach out. We can set up an appointment if you wanna meet with me. I'm available by, by email, also via our Canvas course. Um, make sure you're using your Palomar email for our course. All communication is gonna come through that. And if you have questions, you're struggling in the class, um, unclear on the material, reach out to me. I want you to know I'm here to help. And I really do care about your experience in our class. So I am a cultural anthropologist. And my recent research revolves around examining natural disaster impact and recovery, social inequality, and traditional exchange practices. So I worked in Solomon Islands, looking at the impact and recovery from this large scale disaster that hit them. And specifically, I was looking at the recovery process and it appeared that different social factors seem to be shaping that in a really unequal way. So to do this research, I, do, I did what we call in cultural anthropology field work, which means I go out, it's long term, um, I'm on site, meaning I live with the people participating in the research, the people I'm studying. And I basically try to immerse myself in the culture. I'm there to collect data, ask questions, but also try to sort of walk in their shoes, experience life 
from, from their lens. Um, so I learned the language. I learned Solomon Islands pigeon. You eat the food. I slept with the villagers. Or, <laughs> I always say that wrong and sleep with the villagers. I sleep in their houses. I live there. I stay with them. Um, so here's some pictures of my field work. I worked in two main villages, uh, Titiana, which is an ethnic minority in the region. They're Micronesian, not originally from Solomon Islands. And the other village, Pailange, pictured here on the right on the slide. And they're of the Melanesian majority in Solomon Islands. Picture on the top is a sea tornado or a water spout. Let's put it in there because it looks cool. Um, on the bottom left, this sort of green plant that you're seeing, something called beetle nut. <clears throat> So betel nut is really popular in Solomon Islands. Um, and what you do is you take that little green nut, betel nut, um, rip the husk off, pop, pop it in your mouth, take one of those leaves lying in the middle there and dip it in this white powder that you see off to the side called lime. It's basically burnt coral. Pop all that in your mouth, chew it up, and the mixing of this different stuff creates a chemical reaction that results in this mild stimulating effect. Um, so people chew a lot of betel nut, and the other interesting thing that happens when you mix the lime with the betel nut, the stimulating effect, it also turns this really bright red color. Um, so you can actually see little splashes of betel nut spit all around the village. Um, and if you look closely at this picture here on the left, um, that's Perita, my research assistant with the blue scarf and dear friend, and then Tira, another friend of mine. And if you look at her teeth, you can see she likes betel nut. She chews a lot of it. It'll actually start to stain your teeth red. And if you're not careful, eventually uh, it'll start to rot your teeth out of your head. So everything in, in moderation. <clears throat> um, that's my first time trying the betel nut. As an anthropologist, I'm required to do so. It's definitely an acquired takes. So I'll give you at least one lame picture of myself. And so I lived and worked in Solomon Islands in the 2011-2012 summers, researching people's recovery from a tsunami that hit them in 2007. And I'll touch on my work here and there throughout the course. So I'll just give you a real brief summary of my research there. For those of you that don't know where Solomon Islands is, it's located just northeast of Australia in the South Pacific. You can see that on the map. <clears throat> Excuse me. On April 2nd, 2007, an 8.1 magnitude earthquake struck just about 40 kilometers south of Gizo Island, where Titiana and Pailange are. And within minutes, it generated a massive tsunami up to six meters in some places that struck the southern coast of, of the island. Uh, one of the most severe impacts was in the Micronesian village of Titiana. Uh, every structure in the community was destroyed or heavily damaged. And in addition, 13 Titiana villagers died. Um, it was the highest fatality rate in, in the whole country. Uh, and many of them small children, also a few elderly people, basically uh, individuals that weren't able to hang on to their parents or anything else when the water came rushing in. Despite a really similar physical impact in the nearby uh, Melanesian village of Pailange, no deaths occurred here, fortunately. And moreover, the two villages appear to have experienced this differential recovery that seem to be tied to specific social factors. So what happened? After the disaster struck, um, aid from overseas governments and NGOs flowed into the country. And the, the distribution of this disaster aid was controlled by Solomon Islands government per government policy. Corruption resulted in much of the aid ultimately not reaching the victims. It was misused, misappropriated, stolen in some cases. The remaining aid then was distributed in this biased way that seemed related to this pre-capitalist Melanesian exchange system known as the one talk system. Um, and so that the aid people received wasn't proportional to impact. Some areas that were really heavily affected, like Titiana, didn't receive much aid, while other areas that weren't really heavily affected received lots. So it seemed to be tied to this one-talk system. <clears throat> now, the term one-talk 
means literally people that are of one talk, people that speak the same language. It's a pidgin term. But the term refers more generally to people that are related um, via kinship, but also other ties like speaking the same language or coming from the same village or island. And within the one talk system, uh, people will favor their own relatives and one talks before helping more distantly related people. And the Solomon Islands government and others involved in the aid distribution are not immune to the influence of this culturally ingrained one talk system. So when the aid was distributed, it tended to be distributed in this biased way that favored people who were connected to these one talk networks. Uh, it resulted, again, in some of the most affected areas receiving very little, while other areas not really impacted by the disaster received lots and lots of aid. Because Titiana represents an ethnic minority in the region, they're largely disconnected from these Melanesian-dominated kinship, language, and place-based networks, um, and therefore they were much more vulnerable to the disaster. They had a much more hindered recovery and receive much less aid relative to other areas. <clears throat> it's a good example of another culture quite different than our own. And it's also a good example of what we call applied anthropology. So using the knowledge gained from anthropological research and then applying that towards solving contemporary problems. In this case, hopefully improving future disaster mitigation and recovery in the region. Um, outsiders, NGOs, people involved in humanitarian and aid efforts often go into these situations with good intentions. They wanna help, but it's problematic because they don't understand the cultural context in which they're working. Um, and it, it really, really matters. And it results in lots of wasted resources um, and people not really getting the help they need because again, outsiders don't take the time to understand the importance of these cultural factors. So this class is all about understanding culture and understanding why it's so important, right? We don't exist, we don't think, we don't behave in a vacuum. We're products of our cultures by and large. And, and understanding that cultural anthropology, bleh, anthropology in general really can help you better understand the world that we live in today. <clears throat> Okay, enough about me, what about you? So first off, if you are watching this, if you're here, you've earned a right to be here um, and you're capable of doing well in this class. Your right is also a responsibility. So the course isn't designed to trick you, but you are gonna have to put in the work, the time, the effort to do well and earn your grade. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you're gonna do that, how the course is gonna go. There's two required texts for the course, um, Peoples and Bailey, Humanity and Introduction to Cultural Anthropology, 10th edition. And this is the main reader or textbook for the course. What is cultural anthropology and why does it matter? And the other text you'll need is NISA, which is an ethnography by Marjorie Shostak. So an ethnography is a main tool in anthropology and it's a holistic written account of the life way, the culture of another group of people. Uh, NISA is an ethnography about, ugh, it's only day one. NISA is an ethnography about the Kung of the Kalahari uh, in Africa. It's about their culture, how they subsist and survive and relate to one another. It's very, very different from how we're organized in the US as a society. There's also a handful of articles and book chapters that we'll be reading. All are available for you for free up on Canvas. So you, outside of these two texts, I'll provide everything else that you need. Um, for this week, I have posted PDFs of what you're reading from Peoples and Bailey for you. So if you don't have your books yet, no problem. Another book we'll be reading, which is very short, it's more like an article than a book, is by Hartman and Boyce, Needless Hunger Voices from a Bangladesh Village. And it, it examines why in a country that produces more than enough grain to feed the people living there, are there so many people starving and, and dying from hunger? Is it a, a population problem like we so often hear? We have too many people and not enough resources. Uh, or is it a distribution and inequality problem? People don't have access to the resources we all need to survive. 
You don't need to buy this. Uh, it's downloadable on Canvas for you. We'll be reading it sort of towards the end of the class. It's a good one. Okay, how are you gonna earn your grade? Sort of four main ways. The first is participation points, 100 points um, of your final grade. And so to encourage you to cover the asynchronous material, including lectures, video clips, and also discussion board assignments, you're gonna earn participation points for it. Um, they'll always be due on Sunday at 11.59 p.m. <clears throat> so cover the material. It's to incentivize you to keep pace with the course and cover the material. Concept checks, sort of short quizzes worth 100 points of your final grade um, to encourage you to stay up on the material, make sure you're understanding the concepts we're talking about. You'll take eight concept checks throughout the semester. They're 20 points each, um, but they're not a punishment. It's, again, designed to encourage you to, to keep pace with the course. So this is how scoring works. You'll get 10 points just for completing it prior to the due date. Okay. And then the other half of your score, you'll earn by providing correct answers to the questions. Um, the concept checks focus especially on lecture and reading. So stay up on them. And then also, uh, because it's not a punishment, I drop your three lowest scores out of eight. So only your five highest scores will count towards your final grade. Um, because I drop your lowest scores, no makeup concept checks. Um, and the reason I drop your scores is so some of them. Is so if you are having a bad week, um, you're not able to cover the material that week, or you you know you miss the due date. Um, we're living in a in a crazy world right now. Then there's some flexibility built into the course. You won't be penalized for having legitimate reasons for not being able to do well on some of those. Um, so there's some flexibility built in. Um, take, I I recommend you take them all. Films and film reflections. We'll watch a handful of films throughout the course. Um, they're part of the course, and so we'll watch them asynchronously at a time convenient to you. I think you'll like them. And then to encourage you to engage with the films, you'll complete a graded film reflection at the, after you watch each film. Unlike the concept checks, none of your film reflection scores are going to be dropped. So make sure you complete them. Always do also on a Thursday or a Sunday. <clears throat> and then exams. We have three exams each worth 100 points, um, multiple choice, and also an essay portion. We'll talk more as we get closer to them. Uh, no makeup exams, right? In fairness to everyone else in the class, we all take the exam at the same time. We all have the same amount of time to prepare for it. Um, unless you have a legitimate reason, a documented reason for needing to miss the exam, you know, a, a doctor's note, uh, an arrest warrant, whatever it might be. Uh, make sure you notify me before the due date passes if you are going to have to miss an exam. And I'm not heartless. If you if something comes up for you, communicate with me. OK, come to class, cover the material, stay up on assignments and you'll do well. Some tools to help you succeed. Um, come to class if you can. Live classes on Tuesdays and then asynchronous lectures throughout the rest of the week. If you cannot come to class, it will not adversely affect you, but be sure to watch the recording of those live sessions or you will miss important material. Uh, participation points. Again, for covering asynchronous lectures, video clips, discussions, you're gonna earn points for it. Um, so stay up on the material. Reading questions. I provide uh, reading questions for each reading assignment. You don't need to turn them in, but they're to help you focus your reading so you're not trying to digest and memorize every single detail. They're also good study questions for concept checks and exams. Um, when I draw on the readings, I often look at those reading questions. Film questions. For each film we watch, I provide film questions. You also don't need to turn these in, but I highly recommend that you keep them in mind as you watch the film and take notes. Because then when you go to complete your graded film reflection, those notes from the film questions are going to really help you. Just trust me on that. Canvas. It is critical that you become familiar with our course on Canvas um, because our class is all online, right? This is the main way everything will be delivered. <clears throat> everything outside of the two required books I mentioned is available to you on Canvas. 
Make sure you check Canvas regularly, including the announcements. All com course communication is going to come through that. Um, make sure you're also checking your Palomar email. Um, really, really important. <clears throat> a few other tools. Our course homepage on Canvas. Um, I have a screenshot of it, shot of it here in a moment. Um, it's got quick links and summaries of the material for the entire course. It's got important due dates, um, links to class, links to my office hours, all sorts of other key info. So you should familiarize yourself with the homepage. And also the course is broken into to three modules, uh, broken apart by topic. Um, so module one, to, and then within each module, it's broken down by week. At the close of module one, we have exam one, the close of module two, exam two, close of module three, exam three. Due dates, there's two, there's some flexibility in when you complete it, but you don't want to sort of put everything aside until the end of the class or till exam time. You won't have time to prepare. So this is to help encourage you to stay up on the class. So you don't have to work weekends or Fridays even, but you have them if you need them. Um, so note the due dates and plan accordingly. And read the syllabus if you haven't already. It's just, it's critical to your success in this class. So you know what we're doing, what to expect and what you should be doing. Read it, read it, read it. Um, the schedule's tentative, not much should change. If it does, I'll let you know. <clears throat> oh, and be sure to read the syllabus because our first concept check, first quiz, is going to have questions about the syllabus on it. Okay, a couple of tips for succeeding in our course. Um, attend the live classes if you can. If you can't, no problem, but make sure to cover the recordings. And cover all the asynchronous material. Um, not covering the lectures would be akin to never showing up to class. So cover the material. Stay up on it. Keep pace with it. Don't fall behind. The course is designed to be flexible and accommodate different schedules, but again, plan accordingly. Um, so find what works for you and plan. You know when the due dates are. Check Canvas announcements and your Palomar email regularly. Our course absolutely depends on it. Communicate with me when needed uh, and know that I'm here to help. We are living in extraordinary times. And if you don't, if you're struggling in the class or you're facing challenges in your personal life, I likely am not going to know about it unless you talk with me. And so I will never ask you anything personal or private, but if you need additional resources or support to succeed in our class or even from the Palomar community, I hope, please feel comfortable in letting me know. So communicate when you need to. Accessibility. I've designed the course with you all in mind. Um, everyone has different learning styles. So a lot of the material is available in different formats. Um, if something in our course is not accessible to you, please let me know. Um, it's my goal to make sure that I support each and every one of you. So please, 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 if something's not working, it's not accessible to you, reach out, contact me so we can address it. Uh, and then lastly, just be responsible, communicate as adults and professionals in our classroom, treat each other's courteously. It's a professional academic environment, just treat it as such. And I know we're not going to have any issues with that anyways. A um, couple last things, don't cheat, uh, see the syllabus on that, fail the course and other consequences, just don't do it, it's never worth it. Uh, if you're struggling in the class, the last couple of weeks is not the time to address it. Come talk to me early on so we can troubleshoot and get you on the right track. And grades are not curved. The cutoffs are in the syllabus. So you either earn it or you don't. Uh, and let me know if you have any questions about that. <clears throat> okay. So to sort of wrap up today's lecture, let's do just a little brief introduction to what cultural anthropology is all about. <clears throat> Let's begin our exploration with 
a little talk about the movie, The Matrix. So for those of you that haven't seen The Matrix, so getting a little bit older, um, the main character, Keanu Reeves, right? His name's Neo in the film. And he's living his normal life, going to work, going home, blah, blah, blah. When all of a sudden, one day, a man named Morpheus comes along and offers him a choice of two pills, right? Be careful if people are coming up offering you pills. Um, just kidding. A red and a blue pill. Um, so the plot of the matrix, <clears throat> a blue one that would allow him to continue his ordinary life and a red pill that would allow him to learn the truth about the matrix. Neo swallows the red pill and he abruptly finds himself in a liquid filled pod, his body connected by tubes and cables to a vast mechanical tower covered with identical pods. The connections are severed and he is rescued by Morpheus, who then explains the situation. Morpheus tells Neo that it is not 1999, but closer to 2199, and that humanity is fighting a war against intelligent machines created in the early 21st century. The sky is covered by thick black clouds created by the humans in an attempt to cut off the machine's supply of solar power. The machines responded by using human beings as their energy source, later growing countless people in pods and harvesting their bioelectrical energy and body heat. The world in which Neo grew up was actually the matrix, a simulated reality of the world set in 1999, developed by the machines in order to keep human captives docile. Morpheus and his crew belong to a group of free humans who unplug others from the matrix and recruit them in their resistance against the machines. Okay, why am I reading the plot of the matrix? The point, <clears throat> it's not that you're in a matrix or a slave or in a prison or that it's actually 2199. In the matrix, the main character, Neo, Keanu Reeves, he lives in what he thinks is 1999. Goes to work, he goes to the store and buys food, the seasons change, and life goes on. All's normal. But in reality, this wasn't real. Neo, Neo's reality wasn't actually real. In reality, he's lying lifeless, motionless in this pod. And what he thinks is reality is actually the simulation that he's in, that the matrix created. And so in this sense, the matrix is a metaphor for culture. Um, the way Neo saw the world and his place in it and was taken for granted as, as just the way things were was in fact not actually real. It was shaped, created by the matrix. And so in this same way, the way that we think and behave and perceive the world around us, what's normal or what seems strange is also very much shaped, not by the matrix, but by your culture. Um, the matrix is a metaphor for culture. The, the pill you swallow, red or blue, the culture that you're brought up in, influences and shapes the way in which you perceive and understand the world. And often in ways that we're not really conscious of. So uh, the minor reading, Body Rituals Among the Nasi Rema, is an excellent introduction to this concept. You should read it before attending Tuesday's live class session. If you do nothing else, read this article. It's very short, four pages. It's a classic in anthropology, and it's well worth your while to read before we talk about it in class. Um, you can find it in the Canvas modules in week one. You can also find a link to it on the homepage. Okay, so um, the syllabus typically will tell you what to do next, but since it's our first class, our first day, I wanna give you a little extra guidance. So once you've completed this lecture, which is gonna be in about 40 seconds, um, you should go complete the brief participation point assignment that accompanies it. Um, you'll find the link to the participation point assignment on the same page you found the link to this lecture. Just follow the instructions. It's easy. You'll see. It's one question. Um, that's an easy question. So earn points for covering the material. Um, everything you need outside of those two required texts is up on Canvas for you. Read the syllabus. The first quiz concept check is gonna quiz you on it. Uh, read the minor article, Body Ritual Among the Nasi Rema, before coming to class on Tuesday, or watching the recording if you're not able to come. 
um, come to class tomorrow on Tuesday if you're able for our live course kickoff. And we'll dive in with a discussion of what anthropology is all about. And have an awesome rest of your day. I look forward to meeting you all tomorrow.